sometimes language, sometimes music, thank you, sometimes visual art helps us see in ways we otherwise couldn't. And that's because the arts access parts of our brain that reason can't reach. It allows us to feel, not just think, to experience, not just analyze. It's like the mystery of love itself. We are touched by love, though we cannot touch love. Right? And we sometimes say love is blind, but that's not altogether true. It's that we don't see people we love as much through the eyes of our head as we do through the eyes of our heart. And this sometimes even astonishes the people we love. Uh, who, when they look at themselves in the mirror, they see all their own imperfections, but their lover sees right through all of that to the place where love lives. This is true in our experience with God. God sees us perfectly. God is clear-eyed in God's love. God sees all the beauty and possibility in us that we might miss because of our self-critical looking or that others might miss in us because, well, they're so nearsighted. You know? God sees us the way God sees us because God sees us through God's beloved Son. So, what if you were to realize that however it is God feels toward Christ is how God feels toward you? But what about my sin, we might object. Listen, God doesn't blindly overlook our sin. God sees right through our sin to our true self that is being transformed, and our sin can even be useful in our spiritual transformation. Sin, you see, doesn't finally define us. So to become more like Christ is an inside job. It's an inner beauty that is growing that can't even be contained by the outer vessel, and that even itself is being changed by it. So Paul says he wants us to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge so that we may be filled with all the fullness of God. And there he goes again with his language, right? Language that seems to go beyond the senses. Now, see, the Christian faith brings together head and heart and hands. It joins the cognitive the affective, and the ethical. It brings believing and belonging and behaving all together in one great package. And different preachers and churches and denominations tend to emphasize one of these over against the other. Sometimes they get two of them more balanced against the third, seldom all of them well balanced, you know. I admit that as a systematic theologian by training, I relish approaching the faith intellectually. And there's nothing at all wrong with that. Do you hear me? You know, okay. And then I also admit that I believe the gospel compels us to work for social justice and equity and peace in our society. And there's nothing wrong with that either, even though I know that makes you, some of you, uncomfortable from time to time. Okay. These spheres deal respectively with truth and goodness, right? And Paul speaks to each of these in other places. Uh, but here he touches on beauty. And this is equally important, truth, goodness, and beauty. Another example, I would say, of three sisters, don't you know? Yet beauty is often wrongly thought by truth and goodness, to be shallower for her emotional makeup. But beauty captures something of our encounter with God that is beyond measure. It's like being born again because we experience 
a whole new life in a way that changes us for good. And maybe you felt that way at one time or other in your life when you've sensed the love of God for you in Christ Jesus in a way that allowed you to do nothing but just give in to it, right? And Baptists have language for that. We talk about uh, letting Christ into your heart, about giving your heart to Christ. Nothing wrong with that, everything right about that, as long as we understand that everyone's experience isn't the same, isn't alike with regard to that. It's like different reactions people have to the very same work of art. One isn't right and the other wrong. They are just different. The Spirit makes known to each person the infinite love of God in God's own way, and we shouldn't try to squeeze everyone into the same box about that. 